Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to Middle East Centre. Uh, my name is Michael Willis. I'm the, the director of Middle East Centre, and it uh, uh, gives me pleasure to introduce you to the eighth and final Friday seminar series of Hillary Term. Um, thank you. Welcome to all of you joining us here in Oxford, and welcome to everybody who's joining us online, uh, our friends and colleagues uh, elsewhere. Um, this is the last of the series for this term, and for the last two weeks of, uh, of this seminar series, we focused on crises in the region that have regrettably rather fallen away from the public eye, despite the fact that they are very regrettably very much ongoing conflicts and crises. Um, recent events in Eastern Europe, of course, have only um, pushed discussion and coverage of events even further from the international uh, attention. But at the, time, at the same time, I think they are also remind us and are very reminiscent um, of the crises. Indeed, as we, those of you who came to our event on last week heard, there were clear parallels uh, between what is going on in Eastern Europe and what is going on in the two countries we're looking at. Last week, we looked at Syria. This week, um, we'll be looking at Yemen. Before, and perhaps even since the events in Ukraine, uh, represented the biggest humanitarian crisis um, on the planet. And despite this fact, Yemen um, has not attracted the attention and the coverage deserves. And I know we at the Middle East Center don't cover it as much as we should. Now, much of this neglect is attributed to uh, the fact, or, or certainly to the argument, that there is a relative dearth of people with specialist knowledge uh, of the country outside of Yemen. I'm therefore very pleased to have us with us here tonight, someone who is a genuine expert on Yemen, but moreover is undoubtedly the uh, leading expert on Yemen in the UK. A good and long-standing friend of the Middle East Centre, Helen Lackner, has worked on and written on Yemen for nearly 50 years. She has written and co-edited no fewer than six books on Yemen, including most recently Why Yemen Matters in 2014, Yemen in Crisis, The Road to War in 2019, which is a new edition is coming out this summer, isn't it? Yes, yeah. And also later this year, Yemen, Poverty and Conflict. So we really have a speaker who is uniquely qualified to talk about the ongoing uh, crisis in, um, in Yemen. Um, Helen has a number of those books I mentioned I think you have copies of them all available if you would be interested. Last chance to get them. Last chance to get them. So here is, uh, and presumably uh, uh, signed by the author. Yes, great. But therefore, with no further ado, Helen. Okay, well, good evening. Thank you very much for coming and competing with all the other events that are happening locally, let alone getting away from your latest news on Ukraine. I just want to say one thing about Ukraine. As we are all flooded at every news bulletin from the beginning to the end with dreadful human interest stories and how awful it all is for the Ukrainians, I think people should just, just try and occasionally just simply change the name from Ukraine to Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, Congo, and maybe a few others, and realize that all those people are suffering just as badly and have done for a lot longer. If you look at the death toll in Congo, I mean, it's beyond belief over the last 20 years. So I won't go on because, you know, this is a, an incredibly sad topic. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, nothing further will be said on this topic tonight. Uh, very briefly, I want to go over a few dates. Uh, somehow there's a few anniversaries, one of them that really shocked me a couple of weeks ago, though it shouldn't have done, which marked the fact that Abdurrahman Mansour Hadi has now been president of the internationally recognized government for 10 years. Now that isn't immediately apparent from the way he has governed the place or what he has done there, but I thought this worth noting. I think it's also worth noting given the earlier talks in the last term in particular, that now we're in the 11th year after a very major set of popular uprisings took place in Yemen, and they were partly involved in the resulting uh, war which has taken place since. I think also, you know, 2014 was the year the Houthi-Saleh co coalition or whatever alliance took over Sama'a. 
which lasted for three years because by December 17, the Houthis killed Saleh and that was quite an important thing. And then there's two sets of agreements that have been signed, or sorry, that have taken place, but one of them was actually never signed. Um, since then that were supposed to contribute to peace. And they are the Stockholm Agreement in December 2018, which was not signed, and the Riyadh Agreement in 2019, which was supposed to bring about peace and cooperation between the internationally recognized government and the Southern Transitional Council, which is one of the Southern separatist organizations. And the last anniversary is that later this month, we will have the seventh anniversary of the interna internationalization of the Yemeni civil war, which means that the suffering and killing in Yemen has now been going on for a full seven years. So I think um, this is kind of something that I thought was probably good to start with. Now, very briefly, because I don't know to what extent people here are familiar with Yemen or not, so I may be saying things that people know too well and maybe some others don't. I want to start by saying who is fighting whom and who is involved in the war. So basically we have on one side, the internationally recognized government of Hadi, which is officially based in Aden, but most of its main ministers are sitting in Riyadh and a few elsewhere. And it is supported by what's known as the Saudi led coalition, which is indeed Saudi-led, but where the UAE is playing a major role. I think the UAE until very recently had a successful public relations operation by letting it being called always the, the Saudi-led coalition and keeping in the background, whereas in fact, their involvement has been, if not as intense as that of the Saudis, it's also very important, and they're also amongst the major decision makers on the outside of Yemen. And they are fighting the Houthis. Now, the Houthis, the Saleh Houthi Alliance, as I just explained, but since December 2017, it is exclusively the Houthis. And the Houthis do uh, not only have a very strong and strengthening military capacity, but they are now ruling and governing, and they are indeed governing, and they are indeed governing in a particularly unpleasant manner, but that doesn't stop it from being real, about 70% of the Yemeni people. Now, there are other groups involved in the war, and one of them is led by Tarek Saleh, who is the nephew of ex-president Ali Abdallah, and who has his own forces, which were previously mainly in the West Coast, and have recently moved elsewhere. The Southern Transitional Council, which is one of these um, Southern uh, separatist movements and which is dominant for various reasons, which we could go into later in question time. And then there are various other regional groupings. They are the Tihama Front and various other Southern groups, etc. In the background, and all of these, uh, militarily in the terms of arms trade, which is extremely important, also diplomatically and also to some extent uh, tactically with, uh, in, with intelligence information and, uh, available, are basically the US, the UK, France and other Western states who are opposing the Iranians, who are providing some technical assistance and some sophisticated weaponry to the Houthis. And in the background also, or maybe sometimes the front ground, United Nations and Oman who are trying to mediate and bring about peace. So that's it. So militarily, very briefly, the current situation is that there's basically a stalemate. There's been a stalemate now for many years. There's occasional moments when something's changed in the in the second half of last year, the Houthis appeared to be making massive progress in their attack on Mahib, which had now been going on for two years. Um, but they were then repelled in November, December by the arrival of some other troops from elsewhere. So basically, one has a situation where the move, military movement is not that significant up to now. Um, you have, you know, the, the the focus on the fighting for quite a long time in the last few years 
has been around Marib. At the moment, this month, it appears not to be. Um, that doesn't mean that it won't be next month. So these things are changing uh, very regularly, and I'm not sure we want to go there. Another issue that needs to be addressed is the ongoing struggle between the Southern Transitional Council and the internationally recognized government. Now that again actually has a fair amount of stalemate in the terms of physical control, but it's, uh, it's at least as active in terms of an, a constant skirmishes and conflict as the situation around Marib. Now, to talk about negotiations and peace, which is something that people do hear about, and we have every month a meeting of the United Nations Security Council that addresses Yemen, where the, United, the special envoy speaks, and usually the humanitarian uh, person speaks, and sometimes somebody, in, well, a, a person who is employed or who is connected with the United Nations uh, Hodeida Agreement, um, speaks and they basically always deplore the lack of progress. Uh, it's worth pointing out that we now have a new UN special envoy since last August, who was previously the special envoy, sorry, the ambassador to Yemen of the European Union. Uh, he has taken a different approach from his predecessor, who himself had um, not achieved very much, to put it mildly, in his three years of tenure, but thanks to his great success, he's now been appointed the chief of the whole humanitarian situation in the UN system. So while this is basically no significant progress has taken place in terms of ending the fighting, and very few people who are familiar with Yemen are expecting any significant progress in, in any kind of a hurry, we, it's worth asking why isn't this war ending? And I think I've basically three or two reasons and the third, which is a conclusion, which is first that the fighting groups still think they can win. The Houthis, if they think of where they were in 2000 or even where they were in 2010 when their last war against Saleh took place, and where they are today can see a clear upward trend of increasing power and increasing control. And therefore they are not inclined to, um, to basically to withdraw or to give in. And on the other hand, the internationally recognized government is in a position where if it, if it agrees to any serious changes or to any serious peace, it will instantly and automatically sign its death warrant. And therefore, it's not about to do that. On the other hand, at the same, or rather at the same time, because they have a situation in which there are a small number of war profiteers who are doing extremely well out of this war. And they are not only people who are trading in weapons and such objects, but very much the, uh, one of the big focus of this fighting of, of the profiteering is connected with fuel and fuel supply. And that's a very long and complicated thing that I won't go into. But I think it's something that I always say, um, it is that it is shocking and shameful and any as strong a word as anybody can think of to look at the complete indifference that all these warmongers have to the conditions and disastrous living conditions of the vast majority of the Yemeni population. And although, you know, repeating it doesn't change it, unfortunately. Now, because the, the military war has not been uh, in any sense a roaring success, the internationally recognized government has basically developed and started a financial and economic war and is hoping to um, to defeat the Houthis basically through economic um, blockade effectively. And of course, that economic war and, this, and its implications, again, cause more suffering to the population and precious little to the leaders on any side. But the main features of this uh, war are, were basically started in 2016 when the, they transferred the Central Bank of Yemen from Sana'a to Aden. Uh, 
which resulted in having two competing central banks, uh, both of which are operating, one of which has things like the SWIFT code, while the other controls the details and the information and all the main operations that are needed. The main impact of this has been that you now have a incredibly vast differential in the exchange rate to the dollar for the Yemeni real in the area under the IRG control, supposedly, and the area under the Houthi control. And here it's important to remember that Yemen imports about 90% of its basic foodstuffs, i.e. its basic grains and staples, let alone the massive amounts of fuel. So you now have, at the latest count a few days ago, uh, one USD is worth 600 Yemeni rials, or give or take one, in Houthi land, whereas in the rest of the country, it's now worth 1,100. It rose up to 1,800 at some point last December. So the cost of living, the cost of surviving for Yemenis is incredibly high. Um, another aspect, of course, of this war is the payment of salaries. 1.2 million Yemenis are teachers, administrators, health staff, etc., and their pay, their salaries, which are inadequate at the best of times, haven't been paid or have paid only very occasionally since that happened, so since 2016. Now you'd think that it's in the areas that is not Houthi controlled, but it is. So we have, you know, and both of the uh, Houthis and the others are running oil and gas black markets, which again benefit a few people. So, and the, of course, the anti Houthi groups are very dependent on financial and other support from Saudi Arabia and the UAE. The Houthis are dealing with this by, since they have very little access to foreign currency, by basically taxing anything that moves. And that includes uh, humanitarian aid, and it also includes having a multiplicity of taxation and customs points throughout the country. Again, we don't want to go on forever, so I shall move on to the next one. This is really looking at why we have such a fundamental conflict in Yemen. And this first slide is focusing on the issues which have to be addressed in Yemen, regardless of the war, war or no war, peace or no peace, these particular factors will remain major constraints and are very important to you know Yemeni development and the, so first we have the limited natural resources and the economic potential uh, water scarcity which is well known um, but is you know very important there's been a mismanagement of agriculture and fisheries resources the country has a low level of industrialization and it limited supplies of oil and gas. Had the war not occurred, uh, oil would have more or less run out by now. Gas has some potential, I think for 13, 17 trillion, something or other. Um, and that, you know, although it has reasonable potential, it is limited basically by A, the cost of the infrastructure to export it, and B, the fluctuation of gas markets worldwide, particularly if we look in the foreseeable future ignoring the current emergencies. Climate change, which of course also includes the issue of water, but it's becoming an increasingly important factor and I'll talk about that briefly later on. Another factor is that Yemen still has a rapid population growth, which is almost 3% per annum. So we have a doubling of the population in 50 year, in, sorry, in 20 years. And finally, and I think that's extremely important, is the low level of skill and the low quality of education in Yemen. Solving and responding to the earlier list of, the, of problems I've given can be done very effectively and has been done in and buying a highly skilled labor force that can take initiatives and operate in the kind of economy developed by in the 21st century. Uh, this low level of education and still high levels of even of illiteracy mean that it's very difficult for Yemenis to uh, benefit from this. More um, qu quickly, in 
in a more temporary way, the Saleh's autocratic regime left a legacy of divisions, the ill management of unit of the process of unification in after 1990 uh, certainly contributed to the southern separatist movement. His divided and rule policy again contributed to the current fragmentation and the prevention of new political forces has basically also affected the today's situation where there's very few uh, new people to, for, to be involved in the in this discussions or anything. And of course, the regime was known to be very corrupt, but I must say corruption is a feature that is mostly relevant today. At the economic level, I think there was a clear concordance between the neoliberal economic policies of Saleh, who was in favor of basically providing financial and other the support to the clique of his friends and therefore enriching a small group of people and the neoliberal policies of the international financial institutions. They were, there was no conflict between these two. And again, obviously, uh, none of these things were focused on uh, addressing the needs of the, of the Yemenis uh, or all Yemenis in general. So uh, again, I shall try and be brief on this one. I think it's important to note that, you know, the war's been going on for seven years. Yemen's been going on for millennia and dealing with it all in one hour is, uh, will guarantee missing out and forgetting a fair number of important things that need to be said. So as I just said, one of the main causes of underlying causes of stresses and tensions in Yemen are the very high level of poverty and social fragmentation. Yemen is the poorest country in the Arab world. I mean, was, we're talking about pre-war, needless to say, it hasn't improved. Um, and social fragmentation, as I've just described. Uh, there was a series of six wars between the Houthis and the Saleh regime between 2004 and 2010. Uh, from 2007 onwards, there was a separatist movement in the South, which has developed and is ongoing. Uh, you had a whole series of tensions between the formal political parties at, in, the, in the early parts of the of last decade, uh, mainly between the Salas uh, GPC, General People's Congress, and the JMP, the Joint Meetings Parties, which was a conglomerate of uh, is, uh, the Islamist and tribal Islah party with all the other important parties. So it included some Zaidi parties and it also included the socialists and the Nasserists and the Ba'ath. Um, and they were kind of forming a kind of coalition, you could say. But there was increasing tension around the elections and electoral law. And again, these are things that, you know, we can't deal with in this amount of time. There was a succession crisis in the Saleh camp. And I think it's important to note that, you know, the existing political parties uh, 10 years ago, and indeed still today, um, were very, were, you know, to find differences in proposed political policies between them was really not that easy. I mean, yes, you could say Islam had an Islamist trend, but, you know, they were, I mean, the allegiance to any party in Yemen was not fundamentally based on the proposed policies of said parties. I mean, the Nasserists sounded Nasserist by their name, but you know, the, the, none of these parties had real policies. If one goes into the history of the GPC, it's very clear that um, that it's not. Uh, it wasn't a party. One thing which I think could have helped the Republic of Yemen avoid fighting or certainly improve its overall economic condition would have been. The inter its integration in the Gulf Cooperation Council, which would have many advantages, I think, for all sides. It was systematically excluded, and I think that also contributed to, you know, was another, we could say, proximate cause of the war. Now, I want to just talk very briefly about the, the humanitarian crisis. So the humanitarian crisis, as Michael just said, is described as the worst in the world. Um, there's been a lot of, there has been quite a bit of criticism recently about its management. And there is, a, there's also currently a, an internet, an, an evaluation of the overall uh, intervention. And it's fairly clear that it all, you know, it could have been done a lot better. Um, 
it said it may not be the worst in the world. I think if you really look at what's happening in, happened in Syria over that decade, you know, it's um, it's also pretty bad. However, there's no doubt that the humanitarian crisis is extremely serious in Yemen. There are 16 million people who are, as they now say, food insecure, which means that they are hungry, and 20 million who need some kind of support. I was just looking at some figures from the WFP and others, and they claim that they did a great job in managing to provide uh, support and, and food distribution for about 11 million people. So that leaves 5 million who didn't get anything in recent months. So we are talking about a situation where there is not a famine in Yemen, um, nor is there likely to be, but there is a very major crisis and, uh, and you know, not only is the food situation grave, but also medical situation, infrastructure, and all other aspects are uh, very serious. It's also important to differentiate between what is done under the UN system through the humanitarian response plan and what is financed by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the UAE. The Saudis have a thing called the King Salman Relief Fund. Um, which also does put money into the UN system, but also operates a lot independently. And the UAE operate primarily through the UAE Red Crescent. Uh, the UAE Red Crescent has, is reputed to be operating in a very um, partial basis, I mean, a very biased manner. The King Salman Fund is also to some extent operating primarily in areas where uh, which are on the IRG side, or at least not on the Houthi side, but they also provide a fair amount of funding to the UN system, which is used everywhere. If you look at the, I mean, without going into the details of, of each year's funding, the main year where there was a, a high level of funding, i.e. 2019, when 18.7% of the humanitarian response plan was funded, which was the best in Yemen and possibly one of the best in the world. I mean, usually humanitarian response plans tend to be funded at around 60 to 70%. Uh, the reason 2019 was so highly funded is because both the Saudis and the Emirates put in a significant amounts. Um, I think about one and a half billion between them, if I remember rightly. If you look at what's happened in 20 and 21, you can see that the funding has been much lower, even from a lower basis, uh, lower requirement basis. Um, I think that's very, you know, it's very important because there are many issues that, of course, the Houthis have been accused, I think very correctly, of um, influencing the list of beneficiaries, of making sure that the, you know, of putting, taking people off the lists if they don't like them. But even without that, the lists that have been used have been very out of date and they have not been updated for a whole host of political reasons, which can be blamed on, I think, all parties concerned. I think another element that is a problem, you know, well, first, I mean, the vast, the overwhelming majority of uh, humanitarian assistance is going into basically uh, food security. So it's both food distribution and cash distribution, which is mostly used for food purchases. Um, there's another thing which, you know, operating on an emergency basis is one thing and reasonable when you are in a few days of an emergency or even a few weeks. But when you're getting to year seven, some of it is beginning to look a bit permanent. And that, you know, different approaches could be much cheaper and more effective, and particularly in things like uh, domestic water distribution and uh, medical assistance and things like that. But if you look overall at the situation, most years have been underfunded. And it's also important to note that if you look at the death toll in Yemen, which is, you know, getting on was by the end of 2021 estimated to be 377,000 people. The vast majority of these people have been people who have died directly or indirectly from um, lack of food and malnutrition and aspect that are not directly war related. 
and that's partly connected with the blockades. It's connected with all these other factors that I've just mentioned. So I'll finish with a few words on the environmental issues. As mentioned, um, you know, we've had water is a very, very fundamental problem in Yemen. Uh, this level of scarcity is very, very high. Uh, again, it's a situation that should not be regarded as one size fits all because it varies enormously from area to area, both in terms of the type of water that's available and the quantities and what it can be used for. It's worth remembering for those who are not familiar with Yemen, that Yemen has no permanent rivers, has no lakes, obviously hasn't got any uh, glaciers that are melting or anything of that sort. All the only basically it's groundwater and rainfall. At the, in the prior to the war and probably not that changed since one third of the water used annually was non replenishable so it came from fossil aquifers and therefore is being mined and will no longer be available. Another thing that's important to remember is that uh, the distribution of water and the distribution of the population are not, uh, you know, are not complementary. So one of the, the areas that have the highest population densities, which are the mountainous areas, are areas where water is very difficult to stock and retain, and therefore they are more dependent on rainwater. Which brings us to the next aspect of the, of the climate situation, which is that with climate change, rainfall has become both more unpredictable in timing and more unpredictable in quantities. So while you still have a large number of people who are dependent on rain-fed agriculture, they cannot, you know, they used to be able to plant their seeds in March and they knew the rain was coming. They can plant their seeds in March and they might get flooded next week or the rains might not come at all. So you end up losing everything. And not only is the unpredictability in timing, but also the, the, you know, the types of downpours have become you know, increasingly um, violent and short, and therefore the absorption of the water into the, into the groundwater, into the shallow aquifers does not, um, you know, doesn't happen because if you have this and the terraces have been destroyed, basically everything gets washed away. So, you know, you have that problem. Then you have some problems of floods and droughts, obviously, if there's no water, nothing grows and there's nothing available to be drunk. And, you know, if you look at floods, again, you used to have a few a flood every five or six or seven years in specific areas. If you look at last year, you had three or four major floods in most of the country. I think that's pretty unprecedented. You've also had new massive storms that have happened and cyclones, again, much more frequently, which don't give people the time to recover from the, from, you know, the previous flood by stocking up on food or stocking up on drains. Uh, you know, before they get the next one. So that really aggravates and reduces what they now call resilience. And I want to talk briefly about the Safer ship. Now, while the English word Safer is most certainly the most inappropriate uh, terminology to dis discuss this particular ship, you may have heard about it. It's a FSO, which is a floating, uh, what floating something, Basically, it's a floating storage uh, ship, which is seven miles off the coast in the Red Sea, and which contains 1.1 million barrels of oil. Has been there, is falling apart, or it's not falling apart. It could blow up, it could sink, it could rust anytime. The situation has been extremely serious now for many years. There's been big efforts to try and deal with this. The UN has tried very hard, but again, they had, you know, different departments in charge of the issue at different times. And basically, until now, nothing was done because ultimately the squabbling between the Houthis and the um, IRG prevented anything from being done. The squabbling was based over what would be done with the sale of this 1.1 million barrels of oil. It ignores the fact that after sitting seven years in 
or previously five or six years in a basically voting disintegrating tanker, the value of this oil is pretty uh, debatable and certainly would not command the price per barrel of the cost of oil either today or even when it was at its lowest point in recent uh, months. In addition, of course, to the fact that officially it would be embargoed and wouldn't nobody be allowed to buy it. Now, this situation may have changed. I'm saying may because it's happened before that there appeared to have been agreements to solve it and to do it. But I think it's possible that this time it might work because an agreement was signed um, this week. Well, yeah, on the 5th, whenever. Between, and that's the interesting point, it was signed between the UN, which is basically in charge of dealing with this, the Houthis who control it, and the third party is a very big business company responsible for importing uh, most of Yemen's grains. So the internationally recognized government has not been involved in this at all. Um, they could try and sabotage it, but they've said that they will they want this problem solved, so it will be embarrassing if they do. Uh, but it does prove, and it also, that agreement basically formally gives the Houthis what they want, which is they don't want this oil to be removed. They want the oil to remain under their control. And this agreement <coughs> sorry, says that the ship, a new tanker will be brought and this oil will be transferred to that new tanker. And then what happens in future remains to be discussed. So I think it's important because it might show a solution. It's also important because this is a threat that for all those who've been at all aware of it could not only destroy living conditions all over the Yemeni coast, but depending on the wind and the season, you know, way up into the Red Sea and possibly the whole of the Red Sea, you know, it, it's a very, I mean, if it, and it could still happen. If it either sinks or explodes, it will be a very, very, you know, all the previous ones that we've heard of, Exxon Valdez or whatever, they're jokes compared to what would happen if this thing collapses. To conclude, I just want to say that apologize for not covering more things. And I've thought of many things while talking that I should have covered and that I haven't. So maybe some of you will ask questions to that. And I look forward to the questions. I do want to remind everybody that the Yemeni people continue to suffer from this war and this situation, and there's no, uh, no immediate prospect for improvement, which is something that I think is extremely sad. Just one final thing, when I, if anybody who's read Yemen in crisis will note that I start by saying, I hope that when you read this book, things will have, the war will have ended. And I'm just about to write an updated preface for the second edition, where I'm going to repeat that I said that five years ago, and I'm probably going to try and say it again. And I hope that next time, if there ever is a third edition, I won't have to say it. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Helen. Rather sobering view of Yemen, but thank you particularly for looking at the environmental and the economic aspects, which I think often get 